Good evening and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is Thursday night, February 2nd, 2023. Just a bit of housekeeping. A week from tonight, February 9th, we will not be together. I'll be out of town. Again, February 23rd and March 2nd, we will not be together. I will also be out of town. But in between and after that, we will be together. And I'm thrilled to be with you tonight. I'm so grateful to every single one of you for joining and for being able to have this opportunity for me to study together with you. Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the Red Sea in our Torah portion, Mishalach, <coughs> is deeply etched into our Jewish consciousness. Through the Yom Tov, the festival that celebrates it, the seventh day of Pesach, the end of Passover, through the daily prayer that we say, Az Yashir, the exuberant song sang by the Jewish people on emerging safely and securely on the other side from this week's Torah portion. And we say this prayer every day in our morning prayers. For all times, this narrative stands for us as a testament to God's power, to God's control, to God's interaction and intervention in our lives. But what is the message we should take for ourselves? What's the message about ourselves that comes from this narrative? <clears throat> because we know this story, it's easy for us to miss the absurdity of how it unfolds. So let's recall, the Jewish people have just left Egypt. And Paro and his servants, they change their mind just after the Jewish people leave. And they say to each other, what do we do? How is it that we let the Jews go free from our servitude? And they take 600 choice chariot drivers, and all of the chariots of Egypt, and the entire infantry to support them, a gigantic and fierce army. And they run after the Jewish people to bring them back into slavery. <clears throat> they chase after the Jewish people. And they reach the Jewish people at the moment that they are trapped against the sea. So in front of them is the sea. In back of them is Paro's fierce, terrifying army. And they are trapped. There is no way out. And the Jewish people lifted their eyes backwards. They see what's coming towards them. They see Paro and his giant army coming towards them. And they were exceedingly afraid. They were as terrified as is possible to be. And they cried out to God. And that makes perfect sense that they should be filled with panic, that they should be hysterical because they are trapped. There is no way out. There is no solution. There is no hope and there is no future. The entire exodus was for nothing. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe God says to Moshe, <coughs> Why are you crying out to me? Daber el b'nei Yisrael v'yiso. Speak to the children of Israel and go. What in the world does that mean? I mean, it sounds absurd. What, what could possibly 
be the meaning of God saying, Ma why are they why are they yelling? Why are they crying? I mean, what do you mean, why are they crying? Isn't it obvious why they're crying? Don't they have a really good reason to cry? And what is God's answer? If they don't even have a reason to cry, Dabel ben Israel, ve so. Tell the Jewish people, go. Jump. Jump. Listen to the words of Rashi. In explaining God's answer, Ain lahem ela lisa. The only thing they have to do is jump. She'ein hayom omed bifnehem. Because the sea does not stand before them. What in the world does that mean? I mean, but it is before them. They can see it. It is formidable. It is foreboding. What does God mean? Jump. Jump where? Jump how? And what does Rashi mean? It's not there. It's not an obstacle. It's not in front of you. <laughs> but it's absurd. And then our sages tell us that there was one man and his name was Nachshon. And Nachshon jumped in to the water. And as soon as Nachshon jumped into the water, the waters parted. Now, again, we know the story. We know the sea can split. But Nachshon did not know that. No one ever imagined that this could happen. But listen, please, to the words of Rebetzin Yemima Mizrahi. She explains that all of a sudden something started happening, something that no one could believe would happen. It's splitting. It's splitting. The sea is splitting. Yes, it is possible. And you take a step and another step and another step and you exit on the other side and meanwhile, you leave behind all the sorrow and all the troubles and all the enemies and everything that has persecuted you, you leave it behind and it's gone forever. You really have to picture this in your mind's eye. And I ask you, try to picture this in your mind's eye. Picture you, yourself, passing on dry land, which a moment ago was deep, roiling water. Passing through, not believing what you are seeing, not believing what you are doing. Finding your own path to freedom. And here's the lesson for us. Every one of us needs a splitting of the Red Sea. We need this in being able to earn a livelihood. We need this for our health. We need this to educate our children and our grandchildren. We need this in our marriages. We need this in our private lives. And we need this in our communal life. We must believe that it is possible to change and to be changed. It is possible to exit from the other end of the sea, to go out from the narrow straits, from being trapped to well-being. That's the message this narrative holds for us. That's what we can take from this to improve, to transform our lives going forward. An amazing lesson. But what makes this lesson unique 
is that this lesson comes from us. We jumped in. God didn't do it for us. We did it. We caused God to split the sea by jumping in. But as you see yourself in your mind's eye, as you watch the video of yourself standing at the edge of the sea, the deep forbidding sea in front of you, and in this video of yourself that you are watching, in the moment just before the euphoria of it splitting, wow, there's a miracle happening just before that. Just before we discover that we can find our path to freedom and well-being, just the moment before that, imagine the fear. Imagine what it feels like to face the sea and hear God say, there is no sea in front of you. There is no obstacle if you jump in. Would you jump? Because that's the only way to get to the other side. That's the only way to get this lesson for all time, to be willing to do something that is so frightening, so paralyzing, And you've got to overcome that at that moment because that's the only way you will make it. It's the only way you will reach the other side. John McCain once said, courage is not the absence of fear, but the capacity to act despite our fears. That's what was called from that the Jewish people had to overcome in order for this to happen. So I want to share with you a prosaic story. And I present it <clears throat> as a mushal, a metaphor, to help us relate on a human level, to help us relate to this lesson. It's a story I heard from Sarah Tuttle Singer, You may be familiar with her. She's a unique, I think, an incredible woman. She lives in the old city of Yerushalayim. I think she's a great writer, storyteller. I'm going to try to tell this story in her words. Twenty-two years ago, she writes, something bad happened to me in a pool, swimming pool, at a friend's house. And ever since then, I cannot even go near a pool, let alone go in one. Someone said to me, why don't you go to a psychologist to deal with this problem? And I said, listen, (laughs) I've got enough issues in my life. This is the least of the things that I've got to worry about. So she writes, I watch my kids splash around the pool like seals, trusting the waters in their bodies, while I would sit near the edge with my heart in my throat. I couldn't go in. But last night, at the American Colony Hotel, it's a hotel in Yerushalayim, And the moon was a lemon wedge, and my issues and I sat outside as moonlight rippled off the edge of this gorgeous pool. And the entire world smelled like orange blossoms, and with zero reservations, and with all my clothes on, I dove My heart exploded in my chest and I could hear every thump of breath ringing in my ears. And it was the best. 
I lay on my back and floated, and a heavy piece of me broke off and floated far away. In my entire life, <clears throat> this was one of the hardest things I have ever done. To choose a new way of being in the world over fear. To change my state from someone who was afraid to swim to someone who just gets up and dives in. And I made this decision in exactly the right place and time and the waters were perfect and sweet. And as Jonathan Kestenbaum notes, when we left the house of bondage in Egypt and came to the Red Sea, we had to dive in first in perfect fear, in perfect love and perfect trust before it could split for us and we could walk across not just safely but to the promised land. There are moments in life there are moments in the life of every single one of us when we are confronted with our greatest fear and we are paralyzed by that fear. Often, we will be unable to jump in and we will remain stuck. But sometimes, with the lesson of this event, we can summon our inner nachshon, our inner Sarah and jump. <coughs> so I am a worrier. <laughs> I worry. I once heard someone pose a question if your house was on fire and you had to leave suddenly and quickly and never return, what would you take with you? And maybe because I'm a worrier, I thought about that. I think about that a lot. Photo albums, documents, <clears throat> a battery charger, what else? What else would I be able to carry in those hectic moments? When the Jewish people left Egypt, they left suddenly, they left quickly in the middle of the night. We don't know how much luggage each person was entitled to. We do know they had to carry their food on their shoulder. What other necessities did they take with them? So the Jewish people experienced the splitting of the Red Sea. And the Jewish people walk through it on dry land. And then the water comes back and eliminates the Egyptian enemy for all time. The Jewish people saw the great hand of God, what God had done for them in saving them from the Egyptians. And the people had great reverence and awe for God. And they believed in God. They trusted God. And in Moshe, God's servant. Az Yashir Moshe Vene Israel Sashira Azos Lashem. And then they sang this magnificent song. Moshe and the Jewish people sang this beautiful, beautiful song, exuberant, grateful, beautiful song. As I mentioned before, we repeat this in our prayers every single day. <clears throat> Fatikach Miriam Hanavia. Achos Aram, 
Esatopiada, Miriam, who was a prophetess, who was the sister of Aharon. Of course, that means she was also the sister of Moshe. It's a separate question. Why is Moshe's name not mentioned here? Leave that for another time. Miriam took a tambourine in her hand. And all of the other women went with her, but tupim uvim cholos, playing flutes and dancing. Vatan lehem Miriam, and Miriam sang out to them so that they could respond, Shiru Lashem ki go'o go'o, a song to God. We sing and dance a song to God because God is exceedingly mighty, exceedingly exalted. Let me ask you a simple question. Was there a Steve's music store nearby? Where do they get tambourines and flutes? in the middle of the desert. Listen, please, to the words of Rashi, quoting an earlier midrash of our rabbis. Muvtachos hayud tzidkaniyos shebedar, the women, the righteous women of that generation that merited leaving Egypt were certain, muvtachos, they had a certainty that God was going to perform miracles for them, and they were so certain that there were going to be miracles performed by God for them that would give them reason to celebrate those miracles. They carried musical instruments with them as they left Egypt. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible in ticking off the list, the short list, of what they were going to carry out of Egypt, Jewish women left all sorts of things behind, most of their belongings presumably left behind, but they took musical instruments, they took tambourines, they took flutes. And Sivan Rahab Meir points out that, as Rashi says, they knew something miraculous was going to happen to them. And they knew they would have reason to celebrate. And so having musical instruments with which to celebrate the miracle that they were certain was going to come, that was the necessity. That's what they carried. So there are all kinds of other stuff they didn't take. But to be able to celebrate and as yet unknown miracle, that you got to have. That's a necessity. And Sivan writes, This attitude reminds me of the words of a song by Aharon Razel. Have you made room in your heart for the goodness you will yet discover? Have you prepared for the kindness that today will bring? Alluding to this, our sages say, Bishvil Nashim Tzidkanios Nigalu Mitzrayim. In the merit of these righteous women who were so confident that God would perform miracles for them, they were certain that they would have reason to celebrate, that they brought the instruments of celebration with them. That was part of what earned the Jewish people the merit to be redeemed from Egypt. Miriam teaches us to live with joyful expectation. Miracles will happen. Be ready to celebrate. <clears throat> At the end of our Torah portion, B'Shalach, the Torah tells us, Vayavo Amalek, the nation, the army of Amalek approached us vayilachem im Yisrael berefidim and they began a battle against us, a war against us at a place called Rafidim. Amalek attacked us for no reason. Vayomer Moshe al Yoshua, Moshe said to Yoshua, select men for an army and go out and fight against them, defend 
the Jewish people from these aggressors. And I will sit on the top of a mountain and I will watch what happens. And Yoshua did as Moshe commanded. And Moshe, together with Aharon, his brother, and Hur, his nephew, went to the top of the mountain overlooking this battle. And the Torah tells us, V'hoya kasher yarim Moshe yado v'govai Yisrael, as long as Moshe's hands were raised, the Jewish people were triumphing in the battle, but, kasher yaniach yado, but if he would lower his hands, v'govar amolek, then Amalek would start to triumph. And the Torah tells us Moshe was already an old man. He was over 80 years old at this point. Vide Moshe kvedim. Moshe's arms got heavy and he could not keep them up. V'yichu even v'yasimu tachtav v'yeshev aleah Aaron v'chur tamchu v'yadav. Mizeachad mizeachad. Aaron and Hur, his nephew, they had him sit down and each one of them held up one of his arms. V'hi yadav emuna ad bo ha-shemesh. And in this way Moshe was able to keep his hands up until the, until the sun set. V'yichalosh Yehoshua samolek and Yehoshua and his army was successful in triumphing over Amalek. Now in the past, a number of weeks ago, we discussed the significance of Moshe raising his hands and then being able to do it alone, unable to do it alone, and receiving the assistance of his brother and his nephew. And that way they emerged victorious. But tonight, I want to share with you a new understanding of this curious narrative, an understanding that comes from a story, a true story, told by Rabbi Aryeh Spiro. And the story happened in the worst days of World War II. It was 1939. The Nazis had just begun their murderous campaign. <clears throat> and the Stachina Rebbe, a very important Hasidic Rebbe, he knew that the time had come to flee because the Germans were approaching, the Nazis were coming. And he knew that he had to lead his family and his followers, his students, his Talmidim, his Hasidim, to a neighboring town to Kolbasev. But when they arrived in Kolbasev, they found, to their dismay, that the Nazis were closing in there also. And the Rebbe and all of his followers were trapped. Soon they heard dogs barking in the distance, and now they knew it was for real. Some of the women and children began to cry, but the Rebbe reassured them they would be okay and he calmed their fears. Now, the men around the Rebbe had to decide how, were they, how they were going to conduct themselves when the Nazis came in the presence of the Rebbe because, of course, normally they treated him with the greatest respect and reverence and deference, but they were afraid that if it would be noticeable in the way they treated their great and holy and pious Rebbe, if it would be noticeable to the Nazis, they would know that there was someone special here and they would single him out for who knows what terrible torture and punishment or even worse if they knew they had a, so to speak, a VIP. But they also knew that the Rebbe at this point was an elderly man and he needed help. He wouldn't be able to make it on his, on his own. So they thought it over quickly and they decided that they were going to treat the Rebbe like he was any other regular person, which hurt them to do, but that's what they thought they had to do to save his life. 
And the Rebbe would dress in regular clothing, like everybody else, no special garments that a Hasidic Rebbe wears, in the hopes that the Nazis would not find out how special he was. Finally, they gathered all the Jews in the center of this village, and the young Hasidim and the family members would be careful not to stare at the Rebbe to see how he was holding up because they didn't want anyone else to notice they were looking at him, but they would kind of glance out of their eye and they noticed that he was struggling because they had instructed everybody that they had to hold their hands up. But the Rebbe was an old man and he couldn't do it. And his hands started to come down. And everyone knew that if someone's hands came down, they would probably be shot by the Nazis. Normally, of course, the Hasidim would have run over to help him, but in this case, they couldn't do that because if they would, it would give away his identity to the Nazis, and they didn't know what to do. Suddenly, from across the plaza, a little girl stepped forward, and she walked across the plaza to the Rebbe, and everybody watched in stunned silence. They couldn't believe that someone would do something like this. And even the Nazi soldiers were silent. They were bewildered. How could someone act with such chutzpah or stupidity? And she finally reached the Rebbe, and this elderly tzaddik looked down and he saw that this little girl was his granddaughter. And she looked at him and she said, Zadie, it's all right. You can rest your hands. I'll hold them up. And as if he was releasing a load of bricks, the Rebbe relaxed and his granddaughter, this little girl, held his hands up. And everyone is watching in amazement. The Nazi officer in charge decided to let this little girl continue to hold her grandfather's arms up for some crazy reason no one understands. And this was going on for hours. Hours. It was unbelievable. Hour after hour, this little girl is holding up her grandfather's hands. And the entire crowd was standing watching, silent, in awe. And the light finally turned to darkness, and the nighttime air grew cold, and the hands somehow stayed up. And the next morning, the soldiers were frustrated and they simply marched off with their embarrassed leader and they let this group of Jews go back home. Remarkably. And the Rebbe walked home proudly, surrounded by his followers, his Hasidim, and by his incredible little granddaughter because her courageous act had restored their courage and their faith. And everyone who was present felt sure that what had really happened was a sign from God that the next generation is ready to literally hold up the hands of their parents and their grandparents. And Rabbi Spiro telling the story says, it brings to mind the words of our sages concerning the narrative in our Torah portion, where the rabbis in the Talmud ask, as Torah says, as long as Moshe's arms were raised, it was going well. When they were lowered, it was not going well. And our rabbis ask, how does Moshe's hands being raised affect the battle that's going on below? And perhaps this story provides a new answer. Moshe's hands were being held up 
by his nephew, by the younger generation. And that is precisely what Moshe and those of his generation was looking for, was waiting for, for the next generation to say, we will take over. We will keep your hands raised. We will uphold, literally and metaphorically, the values and the courage that you have done your whole life. You can rest now because we will continue to hold your hand. <clears throat> I mentioned at the beginning that we will not be together next week. Next week is the Torah portion of Yisro. And so since we will not be together next Thursday night, which is February 9th, I'd like to share with you one short piece that relates to next week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Yisro. Next week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Yisro, contains famously the Aseris Adibros, the Ten Commandments. And remember that Ten Commandments is repeated later in the Torah, at the end of 40 years, in the Parsha of Eschanan. <coughs> Excuse me. If you compare those two texts, they both purport to be the Ten Commandments spoken by, directly by God to the Jewish people, Yet, in the two locations, there are a few subtle differences between the text. For example, famously, in our Torah portion, the mitzvah concerning Shabbos says, Zachar es Yom HaShabbos Lekadsho, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Famous verse. In Veschanan, later in the Torah, the Torah says, Shomar es Yom HaShabbos Lekadsho, guard or protect the Shabbos day to keep it holy. Our sages ask about the discrepancy and our sages say, to, par to quote the words that we say in our prayer every Friday night in Kabbalah Shabbos, Shamar v'zachar b'dibor echad, God spoke both words. God spoke both words, Shamar and Zachar at the same time, something that a human being is not able to do. A human being is not able to do that. So in one place it says Shamar, in the other place it says Zachar, but actually God said the two words at once. There's a famous story, an enigmatic story in the Talmud. It goes like this. In the years following the Roman destruction of the Second Temple and the persecutions by the Romans against the Jews still in Israel. The Talmud tells the story of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai and his son who hid in a cave because the Romans were trying to find them to kill them. And the two of them, father and son, spent 12 years secluded in this cave and the only thing they did every day is they studied Torah and they prayed. They lived an existence of pure spirituality. At last they heard that the Roman decree had been rescinded and Rabbi Shimon by Yochai and his son left the cave. But the years of seclusion in this exclusive and rarefied spirituality had transformed them 13 years. And they came out and they saw people doing all kinds of stuff. People planting fields, people doing business, people going to work. And they couldn't, hate, they couldn't take it. They couldn't understand it. How is it possible that people could go about mundane activities and forsake eternal life and spiritual pursuits of Torah study and prayer? And in their zeal, wherever they looked, it was consumed by fire. Rabbi Shimon and his son were unable to reconcile themselves to the realities of everyday life, mundane life. And a heavenly voice came out and said to them, go back to the cave. You're not ready to come out. 
They returned to the cave for another year, another 12 months, and when they left the cave the second time, the Talmud says, they saw an old man holding two branches of hadassim, myrtles. And he was running. It was the afternoon just before Shabbos was about to start, and he was running, holding these two branches of hadassim and myrtles. And Rabbi Shimon said to this man, he was running, and said, what are the hadassim for? And the old man said, they're in honor of Shabbos. I'm carrying them in honor of Shabbos. And Rabbi Shimon said to him, so but why are you carrying two? And the man said, one is for Zachar, remember the Shabbos day, and the other is for Shamar, guard, protect the Shabbos day, observe the Shabbos day. And Rabbi Shimon turned to his son and said, see how precious the mitzvos are among the Jewish people. And their minds were at ease, and they left the cave, and they lived peacefully thereafter. Famous passage, but a very enigmatic passage. What was it about the old man and the myrtle leaves and the fact that there were two of them? What is it there that reconciled Rabbi Shimon and his son to being able to live in a regular, normal, mundane world? So listen, please, to the answer given by Rabbi Avraham Cook, the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel. He explains that Shamar and Zachar correspond to two basic aspects of Shabbos. We in the past have discussed this with a number of interpretations, but this is a new one. According to Rav Cook, Shamar, keeping Shabbos holy, observing Shabbos in a way that's holy, refers to the observance of Shabbos itself as a time of holiness. On Shabbos, there is an intrinsic sanctity to the day. It transcends all mundane activities. It elevates us to a higher realm of holiness. We set aside all mundane pursuits, all kinds of work, and we engage in spiritual pursuits and social pursuits. That's Shamar on Shabbos. Zachar to remember Shabbos, that refers to Shabbos's influence on the other days of the week. During the rest of the week, we are supposed to remember Shabbos. Shabbos is not supposed to be limited in our consciousness only to that day itself. We are supposed to anticipate it during the week. Our sages tell us that Shamar, observing Shabbos, we fulfill that by desisting from certain types of activity that we're not allowed to do on Shabbos. Zachar, how do we fulfill the mitzvah of remembering Shabbos? Our sages explain in the Talmud. If a person comes across an especially choice portion of food, a person should say, Zachar es yom Shabbos, remember this is for Shabbos, let's keep this for Shabbos. I'm not going to enjoy it now. I'm going to save it for Shabbos because this is special and Shabbos is special. I'm going to save it for Shabbos. All week long, I'm thinking to myself, what can I do? What can I use to beautify, to enhance the Shabbos that's coming? In other words, Zachar es Yom HaShabbos Akacho, remembering Shabbos, alludes to the power of Shabbos to draw forth energy of holiness from the mundane days of the week, from the other six days of the week, so that we do not have a bifurcation. Six days are purely mundane and material, and one day is purely spiritual and immaterial. No. Shabbos's influence extends beyond its boundaries so that even during the week in the midst of our mundane activities, yes, we're working and we're going to school and we're doing our jobs and we're doing all kinds of activities, but we still have in our minds that we're looking forward to Shabbos, 
that the mundane is not an end in and of itself. Only the way in which it leads us to holiness. Only in the way in which it leads us to Shabbos. And when Rabbi Shimon saw that Jews could understand that the mundane is not just mundane, but it is a tool to, a vehicle towards holiness, then they saw that the influence of Shabbos could be felt all seven days of the week. The old man was running to honor Shabbos on Friday afternoon, his actions reflected the influence of Shabbos on the rest of the week in the way that they lead us to Shabbos. And that is the goal of what Shabbos should do for us. Transform our Friday night and Saturday into Shabbos of spirituality that is uplifting, that is transcendent, that gives us harmony, spiritual, emotional harmony, and also to influence the rest of our week, to anticipate it, to look forward to it, to have our activities during the six days of the work week lead us to the goal of enjoying Shabbos. My friends, I want to wish you a wonderful evening, and may this evening and tomorrow lead us to a very special elevation to the spirituality of Shabbos this week and every week. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.